segment two of chapter one for Chem 150. All right, so we left off talking about units. So here are some common um, non-SI metric units that we use um, in chemistry. We have the angstrom, we have the atomic mass unit, the metric ton, the minute, the hour, degree C, and the liter. All right, so for temperature, it's actually Kelvin is the SI unit. Um, so Celsius is also a metric unit. It is one to one to Kelvin. And uh, we'll talk more about that when we get a little further in for temperatures. Some useful conversion factors. So maybe a sheet here that you want to print off of that slideshow uh, from the one that's uh, the original. Or maybe you um, just want to you know, pause the video here and jot them down real fast. Um, some very common conversions that we'll use. Um, laboratory measurements. There's four common that we'll be using. We'll look at length. We'll look at volume, mass, and of course temperature. So laboratory, laboratory measurements for length, the SI unit is the meter. So the meter is actually too large for us. So obviously we don't use the meter. Our common, most commonly used metric unit for length is gonna be the centimeter. Um, so one centimeter is equal to 10 to the negative two meters. In other words, we can think of it as 0 0.01 meter. We also use the millimeter quite a bit, um, not as common as the centimeter, but still just, uh, I'd say, close, but not quite. Um, the millimeter is 0 0.001 meters. Now, for volume, we have different devices we'll use to measure volume. Um, in a standard lab, we'll use what's called a graduated cylinder. So the graduated cylinder has markings on it. And of course, we'll measure the liquid up to those marks. And then we would write that down. There's the burette. The burette is actually marked backwards, and so it's a zero at the top. And typically, the one we use in our lab is going to be 50 down here at the bottom. As we run the liquid out, we'll keep track of how many millimeters, um, excuse me, how many milliliters we will use. Then there's the pipette. Now here we have a standard pipette, but we also have some micro pipettes. And one of the labs where we're actually getting together um, this semester, we will use the micro pipetter. And so there it's actually a set volume and then you squeeze it in, put it in your solution and let it go. It pulls up that amount and then we move it and transfer it that way. Here it's a glass pipette and so typically they're marked anywhere between 0.1 milliliters all the way up to 100 milliliters. And here we'll use a bulb at the top and so we would squeeze the bulb, put the bulb to this pipette, put the pipette in solution, let go of the bulb. It pulls the solution up, quickly remove the bulb and put your thumb on the top. So we'll generate a vacuum to hold the liquid in. And then last but not least, the volumetric flask. This is gonna be the SPEC 20 lab. You're gonna be using quite a few of these. And so the volumetric flask has one volume on it. And so you'll pick the volume of the solution you wanna make. So whether it's 10 milliliters or 100 milliliters or 50 or 25, we have a variety um, of volumes in our lab. And here what you'll do is you'll put your solution, to make your solution, you'll put your solute in, then fill up to the line with water, All right? So it's just a different technique. Those are the four different things we'll do to measure volume. So again, for volume, it's the dimension of length cubed. And so the SI unit for volume would be meter cubed, which is relative to a liter in the lab. And then of course, one liter would be exactly one decimeter cubed. Okay, now chemical glassware again is marked in liters or milliliters. Typically for us, it's gonna be milliliters. If you went into a production lab, that's where you might find some liter pieces, but typically we're gonna be in milliliters. So what is a milliliter then? Well, that translates to centimeter cubed. So one milliliter is equal to one cc, centimeter cubed, cubic centimeter. The third one we look at is mass. And obviously we can have different types of balances. Here we have an analytical balance. It's protected by glass shields. Most of the things we'll do in lab will be using a ben standard bench top scale. And so here we'll put our weigh boat on, then we'll pour our solid in and then watch the mass. In the old days, they had a little bit different of a contraption here. This is a three beam balance that's trapped inside a glass tube. That was an analytical balance back in the day. The SI unit is the kilogram. Now, obviously we're typically gonna be using grams. It's a much more you know, realistic size for us. One kilogram would be a thousand grams. Mass is measured by comparing weight of sample with weights of known standard masses. 
And of course the instrument we typically use is referred to as a balance. So you need to be a benchtop balance or an analytical balance. The fourth measurement we make is temperature. And here it's pretty straightforward. We'll be using a thermometer. There are three common scales, the Fahrenheit, which is what we're used to, where water freezes at 32, boils at 212. That means there's 180 degrees in between the two. Now for us in the lab, we'll typically be using the Celsius scale, right? This is the most common for science. Water freezes at zero and boils at 100. That means there's 100 degrees between melting and boiling points of water. The last but not least is the Kelvin scale, and this is our SI unit, right? There is no degree symbol for the Kelvin. Notice we said degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, but then it was just Kelvin. It's not degrees Kelvin. Water will freeze at 273.15 and boil at 373. So it also has a 100 degree unit between melting and boiling. The only difference between Kelvin and Celsius is the zero point. And that's of course absolute zero. So if you're into theoretical science, then you know that at absolute zero, all motion ceases and therefore so does the item. So the item would cease to exist. Now again, we're not gonna worry about theory here, where it's applicable to us is that the zero point for the Kelvin scale corresponds to nature's lowest possible temperature. Now you will need to be able to convert between all three of these scales and your questions will vary. So you want to pay attention to the degree you're in or if you're in Kelvin. And so you need to be able to convert back and forth. Now I don't expect you to memorize these. Again, you can write these down somewhere. And then when we have a question, you can pull them out. So if I want to figure out what the Fahrenheit temperature is going to be, I can take my Celsius temperature, multiply by nine, divide by five and add 32. Now, if you have a TI 80 something calculator, it's already on your calculator, right? There's a button you can push that just converts the temperature directly. You don't have to do any calculation. That is fair game, by the way. So if you need to make a temperature conversion, I would expect it to be inside a question. I would not expect a question to be convert this temperature to that temperature. So an example would be, what is 100 degrees Celsius equal to in Fahrenheit? Well, if I plug this in, 100 times nine would be 900 divided by five, then add 32, it should work out to be 212. Now, common laboratory thermometers are marked in the Celsius scale, which means most likely the conversions you'll be making will be Celsius to Kelvin. For the Kelvin temperature, that's gonna be equal to Celsius plus 273.15, all right? So all I have to do is just add that to my Celsius, and that gives me my Kelvin. So what is the Kelvin temperature of a solution at 25 degrees C? That's roughly room temperature. Well, I'll take 25 plus 273, and it gives me 298. All right, so here's our learning check for temperature conversion. Convert 121 Fahrenheit to the Celsius scale. And I'll pause here for a moment. All right, let's see how you did. So to make the conversion, we know we're gonna take the Celsius temperature times nine divided by five. So that means that TC would equal the opposite of that. The temperature in Fahrenheit would be subtract 32, multiply by five, divide by nine. So now I'm gonna take 121 minus 32, I'm gonna multiply that by five, divide by nine, and that gives me 49 degrees C. All right, let's try converting that 121 Fahrenheit to the Kelvin scale. Since we already know the Celsius, we can go direct, right? We can take the 49, add 273, and that gives us 332 Kelvin. All right, hopefully you knocked both of those out of the park. Let's see, convert 77 Kelvin to the Celsius scale. So here, <clears throat> we'll take the Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273. We know that Celsius is equal to Kelvin minus 273. So now we're gonna take 77 minus the 273, and that gives us negative 196. Convert 77 Kelvin to the Fahrenheit scale. Well, we already did the Celsius scale. So all we have to do now is plug in our Celsius value, and then we'll multiply that by nine, divide by five, and add 32. And that gives us negative 321 Fahrenheit. All right. In a recent accident, some drums of uranium hexafluoride were lost in the English Channel. The melting point of uranium hexafluoride is 64.53 degrees Celsius. What is the melting point of uranium hexafluoride on the Fahrenheit scale? 
is at 67.85, 96.53, 116.2, or 337.5, or finally 148.2. Now, one of the things I like to do is keep in mind is that zero degrees C would be 32 Fahrenheit, and 100 degrees C would be 212. Now we're about in the middle there. So somewhere in the middle between 32 and 212 would be the 150 to 125 range, which means right away we've limited it down to C or E. So again, if you have a TI-80 plus or whatever it is, you can put the 64.53 in and do two keystrokes and have your answer. Or you can use the equation we had before. Either way, hopefully you came out with 148.2. So here's what we did. We took our Celsius temperature times 9, divide by 5, and added 32. So 64.53 times 9, divide by 5, and add 32 should give us 148. All right. On an absolute temperature scale, 100 degree Fahrenheit is not double 50 degree F, i.e. not twice as hot. What temperature in Fahrenheit would really be double 50 degree Fahrenheit? Hint, 50 degree Fahrenheit to Kelvin, double the Kelvin temperature, then convert back to degree Fahrenheit. So there's a little hint for you. Would it be 560, 25, 200, 283, or 566? All right, hopefully you got A, 560. Gave you a little time there to pause if you needed to. Now, if you didn't get 560 and you're wondering, okay, what did I do wrong? Here you go. Temperature Celsius is equal to 50 minus 32 times 5 divided by 9. That gives us 10 degrees C. Then 10 degrees C plus 273 would give us 283. Now, remember, we want to double that. So we're going to double that. Doubled is 566.3 Kelvin. Now, if I take that Kelvin and minus 273, that gets me back to 293.15 degrees C. Then I'm going to take that times 9, divide by 5, add 32, and that's how we got to 560. All right. We've talked about measurements. We've talked about units. Now we're going to talk about the uncertainties in those measurements. Measurements are all inexact. In other words, they have to contain some uncertainty or some error. What are sources of error? Well, sources of error could be the limitations in reading the instrument. Ways to minimize those errors. Well, we could take a series of measurements. We could look at data clusters around a central value. We could calculate an average or use mean values. And then we could report the average value. All right, so what are the limits in reading the re instrument? Well, let's consider two thermometers, okay? So we've got the one on the left, and we've got one on the right. Here we can see the marks a little bit cleaner. Here the marks are not so clean. So on the left thermometer, we have a marking every one degree C. So that means the temperature then between 24 and 25, all right? So here on the left, it's every unit. All right, about three tenths of the way between marks. So here we can see, ah, problems with the pointer. So here we can see we'd have to measure that down into the tenths. We can estimate that, right? Now we can only estimate 0 0.1 degree of certainty, which means we're looking at 24.3 plus or minus a tenth of a degree. On the right thermometer, the markings are to the tenth of a degree. So that means we can see that we're between 24.3 and 24.4. That means my estimate is going to be the 0 0.01 degree C. So the thermometer on the right then gives us an extra degree of certainty. We can now say it's 24.32 plus or minus 0 0.01. So you can see we've moved over one place. So every time I move over a place and I gain more accuracy, all right. Now, what are the limits then? The finer the graduation in the markings, that means the more certain I'm going to get, right? Smaller uncertainty in my measurement. I can keep moving over one place. The reliability of data then is indicated by the number of digits used to represent it. So what about digital displays? 
So in other words, if I put a beaker on a digital display and it measures out 65.23 grams on the digital balance, is that exact now because it was on a digital balance? Well, no, we used to have an, a degree of uncertainty. And we're always going to assume half in the last readable digits. In other words, here in our 65.23 grams, that hundredths place we're going to assume is where the difference is going to be. So that means we're going to record it as 65.230 plus or minus that 0 0.005 grams. Now with this uncertainty in these measurements, that's what's leading to our significant figures. Okay, so the scientific convention then is all digits in a measurement up to and including the first estimated digit are significant. That means if I make a measurement, that last value that we just made the estimate in is significant. So the number of certain digits plus the first uncertain digit. Now digits in measurements from first non-zero number on the left to first estimated digit on the right. Those are going to be your significant figures. Now there are some rules. Obviously there's rules to everything in science, right? So all non-zero numbers are going to be significant. So 3.456 has four significant figures. Okay, there's no zeros. It's only zeros that are going to mess with us. Zeros between non-zero numbers are significant. So in other words, if I have 20,089, or if I read or write it as 2.0089 times 10 to the fourth, either one of those, they both have five sig figs. Doesn't matter how I write it out. The zeros that are in between the numbers are going to count as significant. Trailing zeros always count as significant if the number has a decimal point. So if I write 500 point, which really I should be writing as 5.00 times 10 to the 2, has three significant figures. The final zeros on a number without a decimal point are not significant. They're holding place. If they're holding place, they're not going to be significant. 104,956,000. When I rewrite that, notice I can cut those zeros off the end and write it as 1.04956 times 10 to the eighth. That means this value is only six significant figures. Final zeros to right of decimal point are significant. So if I write it as 3.00, then that means it has three significant figures. Notice that those zeros are not holding a place. So one way to think of this is if the zero is holding a place and I need it, it's not significant. If the zero is not holding place, therefore is not needed, but I still wrote it, then it must be significant. Leading zeros, again, are holding places. So leading zeros to the left of the first non-zero digit are never counted as significant. So 0 0.00012, those zeros are not significant. Only the one and two are significant. All right, let's give it a try. How many sig significant figures does each of the following numbers have? So 413.97. Well, if I convert this into scientific notation, then I can see quickly how many are significant because everything that I write in the front of the value for the significant notation has got to be significant. So that means this one has five sig figs. If I rewrite the six, 0 0.0006 becomes six times 10 to the negative four, then I can see I only have one significant figure. 5.120063 would be the same. Therefore, that means seven of those are going to be significant. 161,000, I can rewrite as 1.61 times 10 to the 5, and that means I have three significant figures. 3,600, now notice the decimal point. When I move the decimal point, I'm going to keep those zeros because they are before the decimal point in the first number. So 3.600, that means all four are going to be significant. Okay, how many significant figures are in 19.00000? Is it two, three, four, five, or six? And I'll pause for you to give an answer. And of course, six, All right? 
Here the zeros are not holding a place, therefore I don't need them, but I wrote them anyway, therefore they must be significant. How many significant figures are in 0 0.0000565 Is it 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11? Now remember one thing you could do is rewrite this into scientific notation. When you do that, you quickly see that it's 7. Again, the zero on the end, I don't need it, but I wrote it, so it must be significant. The zero is in front of the five. We're only holding a place because when I convert it into scientific notation, they're now gone. All right, that brings us to accuracy and precision. This is where sig figs really come to life. So in accuracy and precision, what we're going to look at is accuracy first, how close a measurement is to the true value. The measuring device must be calibrated and standard reference in order to give you your accuracy, right? So that you have a correct value. The precision, how well a set of repeated measurements of the same quantity agree with each other. More significant figures equals more precise measurement. All right, so in terms of golf, if I shoot three golf balls and they all end up over here, and I remember the idea of golf is to get into the cup, Golf for one, we can see we're precise because all of our data is near each other. However, we are inaccurate because we're not close to the cup. For golfer number two, he's got a shot here, here, and here. Not only is he imprecise, right? The data is all over the place. They're also inaccurate because they're not close to the cup. Golfer number three sinks all three shots. So, golfer number three is accurate and precise. Not only do they hit the mark each time, they were able to do it over and over and over again. Now the last thing we want to look at when it comes to these numbers is going to be rounding. So rounding, if a digit to be dropped is greater than five, we keep the digit, the remaining digit, excuse me, is rounded up. So 3.677 would be rounded to 3.68. If the number is less than five, then it stays the same. So 6.632 would be rounded to 6.63. If the number to be dropped is exactly five, then if the digit to the left is five, uh, five is even, it remains the same. So in other words, 6.65 is rounded to 6.6. .6. If it's odd, it rounds up. 6.635 is rounded to 6.4. Scientific notation. The clearest way to present the number of significant figures becomes unambiguously. Report the number from 1 to 10, followed by correct power of 10. It indicates only the significant digits. So in other words, 75,000 people attend a concert. If it's a rough estimate, and its uncertainty would be plus or minus 1,000 people, we would say 7.5 times 10 to the 4. If the number estimated from an aerial photograph, uncertainty gets down to plus or minus 100 people, then we might write 7.50 times 10 to the fourth. In other words, whether or not you put the zero on has everything to do with how exact your number is. Okay, So if 75,000 people attend a concert and we're saying plus or minus 1,000 people, then it would be 7.5. If it's plus or minus 100 people, then we would say 7.50. All right, round each of the following to three sig figs. Use scientific notation where needed. So here we'd have 37.4. The five does what to the four? Rounds it up, so we get 37.5. Or we could say 3.75 times 10 to the one. How about number two? Three sig figs, we keep the five, the four, the three. We look at what the one does to the three. It rounds to the same. So that's going to be 5.43 times 10 to the sixth. 132.7789003, we keep the 132. We look at what the seven does to the two. It rounds it up. So we would say 133, or we could say 1.33 times 10 to the two. 0 0.00087564. We'll keep the 8, the 7, and the 5. 
we look at what the 6 does to the 5, and it's going to round it up. So we get 8 point, oh, typo, should be 8.76 times 10 to the negative 4. How about 7.665? We look at what 5 does to 6. Here it's saying it would stay the same. I would have expected you to round that up to 7.67. All right, round 0 0.00564458 to four significant figures and express using scientific notation. <clears throat> so remember you get four significant figures and we need it to be in the correct scientific notation. So is it A, 5.64 times 10 to the negative two, B, 5.000 times 10 to the negative three, C, 5.645 times 10 to the negative 4, D, 0 0.56446, or E, 5.645 times 10 to the negative 3. And of course, hopefully you picked E. We get four sig figs, so we have 5.645. Right? We look at what the 5 does to the 4, it rounds it up times 10 to the negative 3, because we had to move over 1, 2, 3 places. All right, in the next segment, we'll look at significant figures and calculations. Sorry, the segment was a little long, but I needed a good place to stop, and so we'll pause here.